Good morning. We ran out of paper at home, so we got bright paper that the kids color with, I think. Some school-related something. Perks to homeschooling, you're never truly out of paper. There's something usually somewhere. I was also noticed the new clock. Nice and big so the preacher can see, right? What the time is. <clears throat> I will try to... Uh, you remember last week I was struggling through the message. My voice sounded a little different. Uh, this week my voice feels fine, but I might be coughing. Uh, a little tickle. Just enough to be annoying, not enough to stop me. So here we are. Uh, we are again in the book of First John. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to that chapter, First John chapter 2. Now, I can't speak for everyone, obviously, um, but I would say it's pretty a safe bet that most people would love the idea of a old, loving, gentle, Christian father figure in their life. Right? I mean, every, I, I think every one of us would really love that. I, I envision, like, again, I, I think in pictures, and I envision this, this old bearded man sitting on the front porch in a rocking chair. He's cutting an apple with a pocket knife, ready to just pour out his wisdom. He looks out from his front porch, and he starts the conversation with, Son, let me tell you something. And you're just all ears because you want to know what this man needs or has to say. Unfortunately for many, uh, that man doesn't exist in person. I mean, the reality is, for some of us, I shouldn't say us, my dad was and is there for me. But for many, dad was a distant man, even if he was there. Grandpa even more so. For others, dad wasn't just distant, he was angry, maybe even dangerous, almost disappointed at your very existence. And so for, for you, the thought of having a man like this is almost unbelievable. But I often think of when Jesus, he told his disciples that following him was going to cost you. Following him meant that you might have to give up your very family. But then he says this really interesting thing. He said, but you will gain family. Yes, you might lose these because they don't want to follow me, but you gain all of these who do. These become your family. And these old bearded men become your father figure. We might not have that great man in our family, the one that we can sit beside on the front porch, but we do have one in our Christian family. The Apostle John was that man, and he can still be that for us because he's written these things for us to read. And I think we would do well to appreciate that God has taken the time to inspire John to write these things. What a privilege it is for us to have this old man on the porch with a pocket knife pouring out wisdom for us. The Apostle John would have, as we've stated before, he's the last remaining apostle at this point. The, the other disciples had all been killed for their faith. Legend has it that John was actually dropped in a boiling vat of oil in an attempt to kill him, and then they pulled him out unscathed. They ended up exiling him to Patmos, 
for the last part of his life where he wrote the book of Revelation. But at this point, John is living in Ephesus, and he's probably in his late 50s or early to mid-60s, which might not seem old to us, but in ancient Israel, this was a very old man. With disease, malnutrition, and persecution being what it was, a man who reaches 50 would have been seen as very old. And so I imagine, again, this aged patriarch sitting in his chair, his white beard probably reaching at least to his collarbone. He's got gentle blue eyes. Totally made that up. I'm just saying. This is the picture that I have in my head, all right? He's looking at everyone seated around him with with eyes of concern and love and compassion. Everyone is hanging on his every word, and then we read what we read here in chapter 2. And if you would please rise, we'll just be reading two verses, but they are profound. As much as I like to amplify John's presence, the reality is, is that these are the inspired words of God for us. And it reads, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have this patriarch in John that we can go back to, the words that you inspired him to write that we can read, the truth that we can glean from these scriptures. Father, we thank you for the work that you did and that you continue to do. We thank you, Lord, that your word is alive and relevant today, even though it was written thousands of years ago. God, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your loving kindness to us. We pray that your spirit would teach us even today. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an interesting difference when you, when you study this chapter. There's an interesting difference between the wording in chapter 1, verse 4, and chapter 2, verse 1. In chapter 1, verse 4, John writes, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. These things write we unto you. He's speaking of the collective authority of the message that Jesus gave, the collective authority of all of the apostles, of all of those eyewitnesses that saw Jesus. He, re- he talks about what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have looked upon, what our hands have handled. He's telling the people, this isn't just me. We all saw him. Jesus was risen from the dead. We all saw him. Before culminating in verse 4, he says, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And then it seems, I envision he, he pauses for a moment. And then in chapter 2, he starts off with a much more personal tone. He says, My little children. My children. You can hear the heart of, of John on full display in this statement. He is suddenly filled with this just compassionate concern for the flock of God. A compassionate fatherly concern for the church and for their spiritual state. My little children, he says, these things write I unto you. Previously, it was these things write we unto you. And now John brings it in. 
It's not that the others wouldn't have said this or didn't, because we know that they did. But John wants to make sure they understand that this is coming from his fatherly heart for, this, for these people. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. <clears throat> John is, as we know, quite old by this point. And if age gives us any advantage over the young people, it's that we have had the opportunity to see what sin looks like when it's full grown either in our lives or the lives of the people around us. We have seen the hideousness of sin on full display. We've seen it. See, young people sometimes have a difficult time seeing the ultimate consequences of their actions. Usually, sin doesn't seem quite so dangerous when you're not that old. When you look out at the law, you see a bunch of rules that confine you. You see a bunch of killjoy and, and fun love or fun hating old people. But the reality is, is we've just simply seen where this leads. We already saw it, and we're warning you. You see, it's, it's more likely young people that are going to ask the question, well, what's wrong with that? They're going to ask the question, is it really a big deal? They might even accuse you and say, I think you're overreacting. Or maybe they'll just be right outright and honest and say, why do you have so many rules? See, because we understand the old saying, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you wanted to pay. We've seen it. I think many of us can even testify in our own lives that there are consequences of our own sin that we deal with even today. Even today. There are things that we did maybe 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. And the consequences of those things linger in our lives. Maybe we have memories that we cannot block out. Maybe we have relationships that were never able to be restored. Maybe we have physical illness as a result of the things that we did, of the sins we committed. You see, older people understand this, and John, being the oldest, fully understood this, which is why he says, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. He wants them to see the hideousness of sin. I mean, according to Hebrews 3.13, why are we supposed to exhort one another while it is called today? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This is why the Bible says we are to encourage one another, strengthen one another, exhort one another, lest we be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. And the older people have seen it. We've watched it deceive people. And we cry out, sin not. You think about Hebrews 11.25 and it says that though he could have stayed in the palace, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. Well, what, what was the contrast? What was his other option? Moses chose affliction rather, or Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, the older people have seen it. 
We've seen the pleasure of sin. Maybe we've even lived it. We've watched people chase pleasure only to ultimately receive pain. We've watched people choose money only to ultimately lose their family. We've watched people choose their own happiness to the destruction of their relationships. We were talking about it yesterday with some friends. My wife and I used to be involved in a multi-level marketing company. Don't throw stones. It's a good company. It's great products. And if you stay after, I'll tell you how... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> One of the things that these sorts of companies, and I'm, again, I'm no, no issue with the company or even the business model, but one of the things that happens is that you become very hungry to create a successful company, to make money. And, and one of the things also happens is that you begin to develop a group of people that we call the naysayers, the people who don't believe you can be successful with this company. Either they don't believe in the product or they don't believe in the business model. And they'll be quick to tell you. But what we found was that the encouragement that we were getting, what we were being told to do, was to cut these naysayers out of our lives completely. And what we have seen is that these people, in pursuing happiness, have literally destroyed families, have separated themselves from other people whom Christ calls them to love because these people don't support them in their goals and in their successes. If you can't support me and what makes me happy, you can't be in my life. This is sin. And the ultimate end is destruction. The people who we are called to love, we have no time for. See, we've seen it. We've seen the destruction of pride. If not in others, we've seen it in ourselves. We all remember that time when we stood up and said, I can do this, I've got this, only to fall flat on our face and be humbled before God. We've seen it. Yes, of course, sin can be forgiven. Without a doubt. Chapter 1, verse 9, we memorize it. Of course, sin can be forgiven. But you cannot stop the consequences. The consequences will linger. And so we echo John when he says these things, write I unto you that you sin not. We must grow to despise sin and make war against it. We must grow to recognize the wicked, deceptive nature of sin. <coughs> In Colossians, we're told to mortify which means put to death and put off our sinful behaviors. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is very clear in this matter. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 5, he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when you lived in them. But now... Ye also put off all these, anger, 
wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man and his deeds. This is the call of the scriptures. Put off the old man. Be rid of this sin. Make war against it. Fight against it. Do not give it a quarter in your life. Do not give it any place in your heart. You must see the wickedness of it. We as human beings, we love to soften the language. We call it a white lie or a fib. The Bible says it is a lie. And all liars will have their part in the lake of fire, the scripture says. We call it shacking up, living with my girlfriend, sleeping together. The Bible calls it fornication. And no fornicator will enter the kingdom of heaven. We call it same-sex relationships. The Bible calls it sodomy. The language is very different in the scripture than the way we like to soft pedal it because we don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to hear the truth. But the reality is, is that sin is exceedingly sinful and we must see that and make war against it. But we are also, and John is also, realistic. He says, these things write I unto you, unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin. You see, God's, in God's word, sin is not treated casually, but it is handled honestly. Yes, we should hate our sin. We should loathe the stains that it leaves on our flesh, but we do not believe in a sinless perfection. On this side of glory, this will be a war that we fight. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Jesus said it best. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The reality is, is that John, doesn't, John says, through the power of the spirit of God, sin not. And if any man sin, so the reality is, is that we likely will sin, we will fall, we will stumble, we will show our weakness. So what do we do? Well, unfortunately, normally, there's two ways that we react when we sin. We fall into two, di two ditches. I fall into both, believe it or not, which is really hard. You manage to fall into both ditches. But first, the first ditch is we loathe ourselves. So we sin, we do that thing that we promised that we would never do again, and we, in a moment of weakness, sin. And we begin to loathe ourselves. And the grief and the burden weighs on our hearts. And it's as though we believe that our sin deserves a certain level of a grieving process where we first have to rehash our failures to ourselves. It's as though we believe that God is not going to be forgiving me until I first do my penance. I have to first go down into the dungeon of despair and hang out there for a while. I have to whip myself and beat myself and punish myself because I did that ungodliness again. And I mope around and I loathe myself and I say, I can't believe I did that again. I can't believe I fell for it again. What is wrong with me? I can't believe that God would even love somebody like me. After all of the things that I promised him, this is what I do. And we go on 
and on and on. I've been there. I get it. Or we level up the service. More Bible reading. More prayer. Never miss a Bible study. Never miss a Sunday school. Increase service. Increase activity. Oh God, I did this thing. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read 15 chapters of the scriptures today. I'm going to pray for an hour. I'm going to I'm going to bring sweets to work so everybody is blessed. I'm going to be the kindest person you've ever met in your life. That, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve. What do both of these options have glaringly lacking? I mean, should we feel bad when we sin? Yes, we should. Should we seek to serve God fully? Of course we should. But what is missing? The focus. You see, whether we are grieving over our sin or actively serving, who is the center? We are. We're the center. We're the focus. We're the ones getting all of the attention. Even in our grieving process, we're looking to heaven and we're saying, God, do you see how sad I am? Or we are serving him and we're saying, God, do you see everything that I'm doing for you? John doesn't give us that option when we sin. John says, if any man sin, we have an advocate. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is where our sin must turn us. This is to whom our sin must turn us. If our sin turns us inward, we're missing the point. We have one hope, one means of entering into the holy, holy, holy presence of the Father. And that is through our advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He, John, is telling us, if any man sin, which you will, there is no man that doesn't sin. But when you sin, this is what you do. You go straight to Jesus. You go straight to your advocate. You have nothing to bring. Your best service is worthless. Your, your great grieving does not bear you an ounce of credibility in heaven. It is Jesus who saves. It is Jesus who is your advocate. An advocate pleads our cause before the Father and makes intercession for us. The Bible says he ever lives to make intercession for us. Christ in his exaltation, is seated at the right hand of the Father. He pleads with God the Father for the pardon of our sins. You know, it's interesting. In legal terms, an advocate is one who will speak on your behalf in a legal case. Normally, a defense is going to be pleading your innocence. Right? If you have a defense and you're innocent of a crime, your advocate or your lawyer is going to be pleading your innocence. Our advocate cannot do that because we're not. Our advocate, our advocate cannot come before the Father and say, Lord, this man is innocent. No, the, our advocate comes before the Father and says, Lord, this man is guilty of sin. This man is wretched. He's depraved. He's wicked. Lord, all of the things that he's done, all of the accusations brought against him are actually true. However, our advocate is not pleading our innocence, he's pleading his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us of all sin, he is pleading his case on our behalf. 
This is what makes it so wonderful. Because we cannot atone for our own sins. We need one who has atoned for us. Our advocate, Jesus Christ, admits our guilt, but then enters his plea on our behalf as the one who has made the atoning sacrifice for our sinful guilt. Because of his shed blood, he can plead for us on the grounds of justice as well as mercy. Justice has been done. The blood has been shed. The sacrifice has been made. It's not just simply that he looks to us and, well, okay, I'll let them go. No, he looks at us as literally cleansed of all unrighteousness. Right? We read that in chapter 1. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all our sin. Now, it's also important to note that as we think about this, this isn't a picture. We, we have to be careful that we don't just get a picture of a merciful Jesus who loves us and an angry father who just wants to crush us. That's not the picture that the Scripture gives us. In fact, what was it that the Pharisees ultimately wanted to kill Jesus for when he said, I and my Father are one? There is no difference between the way the Father looks to us and Jesus looks to us. Jesus and the Father are not in opposition to one another. There is no division within the Godhead, no separate agendas. In fact, when God met Moses to give him the law in Exodus 34, verse 6, it reads that the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. This is our God. There is no angry God ready to crush us and a son ready to come and try to hold him back. In Christ, God shows himself merciful. In Christ, God makes a way for us to be forgiven. And after God proclaims this, what does Moses respond? He bows his head in worship. He bows his head in worship. And so as we ponder in our minds, as we think about this reality, that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, may we join Moses in worshiping this amazing God. As we consider what it took to secure our salvation, may we worship with Moses, this great and merciful and loving and kind God who has made a way through the advocate, Jesus Christ. <coughs> but like a bad infomercial. But wait, there's more. He's not just an advocate. Verse 2 says, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. One writer wrote it this way. He is to us all that is needed for propitiation in behalf of our sins. The propitiatory sacrifice provided by the Father's love removing the estrangement and the separation on God's part against the sinner. I believe it's in Colossians. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. There's a scripture that says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He did it all. That's what makes the picture so beautiful. See, and this is why we have nothing to boast of. We can't look to heaven and say, God is happy with me because I fill in the blank. God is happy with me because of Jesus. He is my advocate. He is my propitiation. He is my all in all. 
The word propitiation and atonement come from the root word which means to cover. And it's a blessed fact that not only are our sins forgiven, but we are covered by him. Jesus kind of gives this picture when he talks to Jerusalem. There's a scripture where Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. And he he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have covered you as a hen does her brood? You, You get this picture of a hen. I remember I watched a short video clip a while ago. This, this, uh, what do you call it? It's a disc, but it's not a disc. It's a harrow, but it's not a harrow. It's, a, it's an earth, it's a, it's a farming thing. I'm from Saskatchewan, I should know this. It's a, it's a, there's only another one, right? There's, there's the harrow, there's the disc, there's the cultivator. cultivator. My word. All of my Saskatchewan people are collectively just... There's this video of this bird who had built a nest on a field. And this this camera is sitting there and this harrow comes by, or cultivator. And as it comes by, it gets closer and closer. The the, the tractor obviously sees the bird because he's got the camera set up. So he lifts it up and he comes over top. And you see this bird who's sitting on on her eggs And she stands up and she puts her wings out like this. Like she's in full protection mode over her eggs. And it's it's such a beautiful picture because the reality is, is if that farmer wanted to just put it down, the bird's dead, everything's dead, it's all destroyed. But this mother was ready to fight this thing, right? She was protecting it. The difference between the bird and Jesus is that Jesus actually has that power. When he puts his, you under his wings and he protects you and he covers you, nothing can get to you. You are covered by Jesus Christ. You are covered by his blood. Your sin, though it was scarlet, is now whiter than snow. The worst thing that you have done has been removed as far as the east is from the west. Jesus, this, this word, this, that, this propitiation word, they come from a root word which means to cover. It's covered. It's gone. It can no longer be seen. He is the propitiation for our sins. Everything that needed to be done on your behalf has been done. But not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Even the reformer Martin Luther recognized it when he wrote, Thou too are a part of the world, so that thine heart cannot deceive itself and think, The Lord died for Peter and Paul, but not for me. If you are in the world you can receive this propitiation as well. This can be applied to you as well. What an amazing gift. It is available to all who will put their trust and faith in Christ. It is open. Not ours only, says John. It's not just for us. This is one of the reasons why he wants us to go into all the world. Tell everybody the propitiation has been made. The provision is available. Do not deceive yourself and think the Lord died for Peter and Paul, but not for me. Oh, he died for you as well. And he wants to make a way for you. I was reading an article last week on this very thing. It came to my email, which I thought was pretty interesting. And I want to read this comment that he wrote about our advocate with the Father. When you're tempted to look at your sin and despair, or you're tempted to look at your life and want to ratchet up the service so that God will be happy with you, instead, take your eyes off yourself, 
Take your eyes off of your weakness. Take your eyes off of everything that you can possibly bring to the table and fix your eyes on Jesus. Jesus, you must remember, is the God-man. Jesus is our warrior savior. Jesus is the greater David. Jesus is the great high priest. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. Jesus is the father's beloved son. Jesus is our elder brother, strong, attentive, mighty in kindness. The watchman on the wall who keeps the night shift as the storm rages all around him so that we can sleep soundly in our beds. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is our continual Sabbath rest. There is no end to the goodness and the mercy of Jesus. May our sin, that we will sin, drive us back to him. Do not despair. Do not despair. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you again this beautiful, beautiful morning. And we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the advocate who is interceding on our behalf. We thank you for the cleansing blood that makes us whiter than snow. We thank you, Lord, that he is the propitiation for our sins. Lord, we thank you that he has made a way that we can be forgiven and enter into a relationship with you. That because of Jesus, we can walk with you. We can talk with you. We can hear from you. We can serve you. Not because we are good, but because you are. Not because we deserve it, but because he does. Not because we bring anything to the table, but because you bring everything to the table. Oh, may Jesus receive the honor and glory due to his name. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.